Hey everybody, welcome to our uh, February Flex series. Happy Thursday, we're glad you can join us as always. Um, and again, let's start off by like we always do, right? Hopefully everybody's doing well, uh, healthy, safe, uh, you, your loved ones, obviously a lot going on with, in, in this country right now. So hopefully you're all doing well. And we certainly appreciate you joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about our session today. Um, every time we get a chance to have this individual uh, come on board and, and do some stuff with us, one, we're fortunate and we appreciate it. And B, it's always just a tremendous session. So um, really looking forward to today. I was glad he was able to do it. And before I bring him on, let me just give you uh, a little bio on our guest presenter today, Dave Stevens. Uh, probably goes without saying most of you have either read, seen Dave in some form or fashion at an event, on TV, online, you name it. But let me tell you just in case, right, why I'm always glad to have him on. Um, he has an extensive background in real estate finance and mortgage banking. You know, if you don't know, Dave's been at Freddie Mac. He was uh, at, over at the Mortgage Bankers Association as president. He's been at Wells Fargo locally here in the mid-Atlantic and what's defined as the mid-Atlantic in the East Coast. He was over at Long and Foster Real Estate Company. Obviously for a two year period, 2009 to 2011, he was the US Assistant Secretary of Housing and FHA Commissioner. Uh, he's involved in a lot of different things, mortgage related. Uh, so for example, he's a co-founder of MBA Open Doors Foundation, which is a nonprofit providing assistance for mortgages for families with critically ill children. And we were just joking around a little bit before we started, and I'll probably ask him about it again, but he's a huge Colorado guy, went to the University of Colorado. So I know he's excited about primetime being out there now as their coach. Um, and then he's been recognized and has multiple designations, you know, National Mortgage Professionals, Mortgage Professional of the Year, Bloomberg's 50 Most Powerful People in Real Estate. And I could go on and on and on. Um, so, like, with that being said, look, I'd love to get this session started and get uh, Dave on stage. Hey, What's John, going on, how are you? Good, man. How you doing? I'm good. Good to see you again. Always good to see you. Hey, we were just reminiscing a little bit about the, the good old days and all the people we still stay in touch with. But seriously, for anybody else on here that might be watching that's a Buffalo fan, are you excited about primetime? Is the alumni excited about this? We are very excited about primetime, and uh, if you're an alumni of CU and you follow them at all, you're probably getting regular videos that uh, he's putting out from Colorado, and obviously some amazing draft picks, uh, recruitment picks already for the college. So maybe for the first time in decades, we might have ourselves a, a real football team again. It would be fun. There you go. Um, well, hey, man, again, thank you for doing this. I, I know we, we put these events on to try to bring value to, yeah, right, there you go. We try, we put these events on to try to bring value <laughs> to our business partners and, and, and you carving out some time to do that today certainly brings a, a tremendous amount of value. So I don't want to waste any more time. Let's get into it. That sounds great. Well, look, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but John and I used to work in the same organization. Um, back in the day when we could sell deferred interest, <laughs> negative <laughs> amortizing, uh, cost of funds, adjustable rate mortgages. You have to have been in the business prior to the Great Recession to know what I'm talking about. But um, uh, look, it's great to be with you. I currently am the CEO of a, of a consulting firm called Mountain Lake Consulting. My clients are independent mortgage bankers and mortgage lenders around the country. Um, technology firms, down payment assistance providers, hedge funds in New York. I have a whole variety of clients uh, that we spend a lot of time talking about the business. We spend a lot of time talking about policy. So um, today I'm not going to talk about LLPA grids or 40 DTI caps or uh, insurance challenges in Florida and California, although I'm glad to do that later on if you want. Um, but I am going to talk about uh, the business. And to do that, um, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm not going to paint a negative argument for you. My, my goal today with all of you guys as salespeople, which is really what you are, is to give you tools that you can use with the people you call on every day uh, to try to get business. And um, I assure you that the people you call on every day are struggling greatly 
with this market as well. I did a presentation for one Compass real estate office a few months ago. And before you knew it, I was being asked to um, do this same presentation almost to their entire company, a little less technical, but it was the same presentation. They're dying for tools. And so um, John and team have this presentation. You don't need to take screenshots, uh, but feel free to use it as if any of it, all of it, whatever might help you. But I'm going to make an argument today is why, uh, about why now is the time to buy. And I'm going to do it under these points below. One, I'm going to give you a discussion about interest rates, both where they stand today to put some perspective your way, uh, but also to show you why rates are going to come down. I know that's hard to believe based on what's happening this week, but I can assure you the moment Powell's done, we're going to see rates begin to, to uh, improve. Not, we're never going to go back to the low to mid twos. And the Fed is never going to get back into quantitative easing. So they're not going to start buying mortgage-backed securities. But just the act of stopping uh, the tightening that they've been doing for the last many months uh, will be have an extraordinary impact on long bonds, particularly mortgage-backed securities. And so I'll walk you through why, why that's there and why other economists are saying that rates are going to come down by the end of the year. Um, and by the way, guys, as quickly as we saw rates go down to two and a quarter in March of 2020, when the Fed dove in uh, with a massive round of QE and blew up all our high pipeline hedges and everything that happened back in 2020, if you can all remember that, that now, um, and as quickly as they rose at the end of last year, markets can move very quickly. And the Fed is a big driver and has been a big driver on both of these actions. So Let's just go through that, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get through it pretty quickly. And then I want to talk about the market ahead, because I'm going to emphasize to you that you are all sitting on the front doorsteps of the biggest purchase market that has ever happened in the United States of America in the nation's history. And I'll show you the, de the data as to why that is. And finally, I'm going to just highlight that it, you know the Warren Buffett theme um, you know, is uh, be aggressive when others are fear fearful, I think is a great lesson for us right now because everything I show you is going to walk you through that, that phase. And I don't know why my whole slide isn't showing here. I hope it's not the same way all the way through. But um, so you know this slide. This is from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. It's the history of 30-year fixed rate mortgages going back to 1970. Uh, and the only thing I emphasize on this um, and normally you'd see a vertical line, a horizontal line, excuse me, at where we are today, but uh, it, the download didn't work all that well. But nevertheless, um, if you look at where we are today, and yes, we're bumping around the mid sixes for no points on a 30 year. Um, we're bumping around the low sixes for 15. We're bumping in the mid to low fives for, for hybrid arm. Um, but the thing I wanna emphasize to you guys, if you take where we are today and go back Back to 1970, the only time we've really been a low, below the level we're at today is when the Great Recession started in 08. That's that wide gray bar just before 2010. By the way, on the Federal Reserve website, every vertical uh, gray bar is a recession that the nation's been to. So as you can see, there's been seven of these since um, 1970, and there'll be another gray bar here on the far right uh, once we go into a recession, which is about to happen as we speak based on the current Fed actions. But I want to emphasize to you that when the, the, if you take out the time when the Fed was uh, engaging in quantitative easing, meaning buying mortgage-backed securities out of the market, which happened three times since the Great Recession of 08, and then the huge one in the pandemic recession in March of 2020, rates have generally been above the number we're at today. And so I try to get people to recognize we've got to stop like waiting for something. We've got to tell consumers to stop waiting for something. Rates today are incredibly good interest rates when you reflect over time and put perspective to it. And the only time they've been lower than this in this long multi-decades history is with two back-to-back -back hundred year floods in recession speak. The biggest recession since the Great Depression which is the 08 housing crisis, and then the 2020 pandemic recession. We've never had the, 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 these two profound incidents like this occur since the depression and never so closely tied 
within a decade of each other. And that's what drove rates low. People have to recognize that these rates are pretty good. But I will say, all that being said, there's more to this story. So this is the Mortgage Bankers Association. It's a fresh presentation that their chief economist, Mike Frattentoni, just gave at the Commercial uh, Mortgage Bankers Conference in San Diego this week. And uh, I just want to highlight what this is talking about. Um, and by the way, Frat and Tony, just because he's a trade group economist, he's a PhD from Johns Hopkins. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Washington. I recruited him into that job. And the day I hired him when I was running the Mortgage Bankers Association, I got a call from a, the guy who taught me capital markets at Freddie Mac. And he said, you just hired the best economist in the country. So uh, this guy's got cred. But more importantly, I just want you to look at what these numbers say. So the gray line is overall mortgage volume, goes back to 2002 and looks ahead at 2025. The orange vertical bars are refis. The blue vertical bars are purchases. Um, it is forecasted that this year is going to be worse than last year. And it's going to be worse because we're going to front load in 2023, the worst of it all. This is going to be the worst first half of the year that many of you will remember in a, in a long, long time. But don't look at the overall volume because I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at purchase activity, which is the blue bars. And as you can see, I drew a horizontal line there looking to the left. And if you look at what's forecasted for this year, even though it's lower than last year by a little, lower than 2021, which was you know 18% uh, home price appreciation year over year, two and a quarter percent interest rates, Shooting ducks in a barrel was the name of the game in refi and purchases. But if you look at this history going back to 2002, over two decades, this year, even with it being lower than last year, will be the third best year in the last 22 years uh, or 21 years. And if you look at the forecast over the next few years for purchase transactions, 24 and 25, that, that's not an arbitrary forecast, guys. I want to assure you, as rates drop later this year, which I'm going to tell you why in a second, uh, home buyers are going to start coming out in the market. We're still going to have inventory shortages. So it's going to revert back to a seller's market again, purely. Uh, and then the subsequent couple of years, as demographics kick in, uh, which, is, which is happening literally in front, on our front doorstep, we're going to see increased purchases. The problem is, for all of you, we're never seeing 2020 and 2021 again. And we have an industry that, that got too big. And so we are still right-sizing. I mean, you heard it. Even this company uh, made changes in its retail division. Wells Fargo is making changes in its retail division. Uh, large independent mortgage bankers are merging or shutting down channels altogether. You read it in the paper every day. That's called right-sizing, guys. And we've been through right-sizing. John, you and I have been right through right-sizing uh, right. in previous, previous contractions. It's happening. And as right-sizing finishes its job, margins will return to the, biz the business. And those that know how to sell in a purchase market, which is a different skill than selling in a refi market, are going to be the ones who are successful. And the good news is purchase activity is only going to increase over the next several years. So let's switch to rates for a second. Um, the left is it from an uh, interview with uh, Duncan from Fannie Mae. He's our chief economist. And he believes that rates will fall to four and a half by the end of 2023. Now, Duncan said the average rate for the year is still going to be in the high fives, but that it'll fall to four and a half by the end of the year. That's aggressive in my view. Fannie is always aggressive. If you ever look at the Urban Institute's uh, website, look them up, pull up their quarterly chart book for their housing um, group. It's a great chart book with tons of data about what we do but they always compare the forecasts of Fannie, Freddie, and the NBA, and Fannie's always aggressive. Um, but on the right is Freddie's chief economist, Frat and Tony. Mortgage rates will fall to 5.4% as recession is likely to hit the U.S. economy in 2023, the NBA CEO said. And I talked to Mike this morning because of what's happening this week, and he is absolutely confident that's still the case. The bumping around you're seeing right now is emotion in the market, and emotion is crushing the 30-year market because – People can't make duration bets when they don't know, you know, they look at CPI and employment numbers and are not sure when the Fed's going to be done. And all of that puts a layer, a pall over the interest rate market. I'll show you how that plays out in just a second. But multiple economists are predicting rates to drop sub six by the end of the year. 
And that's a good thing. It won't be the two, two and a quarter, three or four that you all had in those boom years. But I believe once Powell says QT is over and rates start uh, coming back to their normalized spreads, which is all they have to do, uh, we'll start seeing home buyers come out of the woodwork, which is why I think those who are taking the opportunity right now and buy now are going to be the most successful. Now, why do I say uh, this with such assurance? Three slides coming at you. I'm going to go through them as quick as I can and just, you know, look at them later. But I just want to draw the picture. This is, again, from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. It's the history of the Fed funds rate going back to 1955. So that's a long time, guys, 1955. And in that period of time, we've had 10 recessions, as you can see by the shaded vertical bars. If you studied economics uh, in, in college, you can name a lot of these recessions. The oil patch crisis in the early 1980s, the 1994 uh, uh, March or April of 94 recession, the dot-com boom, uh, dot-com crash in the early 2000s, the Great Recession of 08, the pandemic recession of 2020. You can take all of these and weave them together. It doesn't matter what caused them. But if you look at just the oil patch crisis, for example, that led up to those super high rates in the 1980s, that was because Saudi Arabia had an oil embargo. Uh, it drove the price of fuels globally and in the U.S. through the roof. Um, the cost of everything to transport goods and services went through the roof. Cost of airline, automobiles, trucking, shipping, you name it. And Paul Volcker, the head of the Federal Reserve, had to slow down inflation. But that was in a really bad economy. We're in a really amazing economy now, but the only thing I want you to look at in this picture, look what happens every time the Fed starts tightening, every single time, going back to the first recession uh, in the late 1950s. The, the, the Fed starts tightening, the red line goes up, we go into a recession, and then the Fed rates drop. Every single recession, if this was a phenomenon, a one-off, I wouldn't say it's going to happen again. But it's not that it's just happened once. It's happened 11 times here. And it's going to happen again. I assure you, the Fed always misses because uh, they don't understand the dynamics. They keep tightening because they don't see the number in current data, even though you can see that uh, uh, inflation is already slowing significantly to a rate of about 3.5% right now based on the number released this week on an annualized basis but they still say it's too high and they're going to crush us. So the Fed's going to kill us here. Um, we'll move into recession, rates will drop. And I assure you, whether it's one or two more increases, that's the max they got uh, in terms of wind in their sales from that standpoint. So why do I think rates are going to come lower um, uh, going forward? This is the spread of the 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage, average in the United States, post on the Federal Reserve website, and the 10-year treasury. Now, if you look at where I put that vertical line in the middle, that red line around 2018, 2017, 18, um, that's the normalized spread of the 30-year over the 10-year. You know, we always use the 10-year as a benchmark to track what we think will happen with 30-year mortgages. Typically runs around 150 basis points to 200 basis points over the 10-year. But that's not the case today. Today, we're 250 basis points over the 10-year. We were as wide, if you look at the far right, we were as wide as 300 basis points over the 10-year. So why is that happening? It's happening because traditional mortgage-backed security buyers are sitting on the sidelines, not just the Fed. Um, when I was the FHA commissioner and the Federal Housing Commissioner, I had to travel to China and Japan and visit all these uh, buyers of mortgage-backed securities in the country. They're not buying MBS right now. They're not buying MBS. Why? They can't predict duration. They can't predict the DV01. They can't predict how soon those loans will prepay because they know rates are going to come down. They assume it's essentially hot money that'll pay off and they need long duration assets to match what they have on their balance sheets. They, they don't need hot money to buy a 30 year MBS. It's, they're buying a 30 year MBS for duration and they know that these things are going to run in the next four to six months. So lack of demand, we're short about $2 billion a day in uh, uh, an, an appetite for mortgage-backed securities. That lack of demand drops prices, raises yields, and that's why mortgages are artificially wide over the 10-year. So we don't need a miracle to happen, guys. 
Once the Fed starts tightening, we are going to see the 30-year return to a more normalized level over the 10-year, and that alone will bring it sub-6. But there's another thing that everybody's looking at. They're looking at the inverted spread. Some of you guys may subscribe to Barry Habib. That's great. He talks about the same thing uh, in a different char- in a different way of presenting it. But, you know, look, if you put your money in the bank today uh, and your the teller says you can put it in a two-year CD or a 10-year CD, you expect to get paid more for the 10-year. But you can't, right? The 10-year is inverted to the two-year. The two-year is actually paying 460. The 10-year is paying only 380. We have an 80 basis point in uh, uh, inversion in the yield. Now, why is that happening? It's happening because long-rate investors who aren't, aren't buying mortgage-backed securities are buying 10-year treasuries because even though the yield's lower than a mortgage coupon, they need a duration match over a long number of years that's predictable. This is predictable. And so if you look at the 10-year auctions, and those of you who've been tracking the 10-year, it's actually been coming down a bit since its highs because demand at auction is really strong for the 10-year. But that inversion also screams to money makers, to, to dealers, to Goldman Sachs economists and more that mortgage rates are coming down. Uh, no question about it. The long end of the tail is short. It's coming down. And that's something that uh, brings all those economists from those headlines I showed you a moment ago to say, guys, rates are coming down. Now, they'll argue whether it's four and a half or five and a half. That doesn't matter. All we need is for it to come down. Okay, let's shift. People are saying, will say to you, you know, I'm going to wait to buy a home. I'm going to wait till, I don't know what they're waiting for. I mean, to me, the, the, the most ludicrous proposition in America is to think that consumers are going to outsmart the market. It's the same people who bet on the dot-com stocks and Bitcoin. I mean, in the end of the day, look at this. This is the median sales price for all homes sold in the United States going back to 1960. When I was three years old, we go through three, six, eight recessions in that period of time. This goes back to 1960. And I don't give a damn, guys. Home prices only go up. Do they shift a little bit in a recession? Sure. But they, but if you ask me what I'm advising all of my adult children to do, uh, my second, my oldest just is now in, just bought her second home buy real estate and hold on to it. If you're a property flipper, you're not my client. I don't need to talk to you. But if you want to ask, is now a good time to buy a home? Oh my God, are you freaking kidding me? When I show you the da- dynamics that are in the market right now that are in the next couple slides, it'll show you why this line ain't coming down at all ever. Uh, home prices only go up. Now, can I say this? Um, even though we had the Great Recession and home prices dropped, they dropped, but look what they recovered to. They're well above where they were In the worst recession, a housing crash in the United States since the Great Depression. Anybody who bought a home in 2009 is rich off of that home because they bought it in the peak of the recession. Um, Be courageous when others are fearful. You know, it's the uh, Buffett's a genius and other people who take advantage of markets understand this. So why do I think home prices are going to continue rising? This is a slide from Moody's Analytics. So Mark Zandi, uh, Professor Zandi, is the chief economist for Moody's Analytics. He's in Washington, D.C. all the time. He testifies in front of Congress all the time. He's advisors to presidents. He was John McCain's chief economist uh, when McCain ran for president and would have probably been his head of the National Economic Council if he had won. Um, He's a brilliant economist. But all he did in this slide, which is just a recent, um, you see on the bottom right, January 2023, It shows the current available supply of homes for sale and rent in the United States going back to 1965. And all I want to highlight to you is where we are right now. We haven't had this low a supply of home since the late 1970s. It's crazy. And up in the top left, he calls out the shortage. But let me just explain how he does that math in in his, his sentence below the blue line. The housing shortfall right now is 1.6 million homes. 700,000 homes for sale we have a shortfall on, 900,000 homes for rent. Um, and this is equivalent. This is consistent with his equilibrium vacancy rate. I'm not going to go you down that rabbit hole. But in the end of the day, you know, this is not 2008. I remember over the last, you know, 
six months as I've been doing these for audiences of our people from our industry, I think this is like the great, the housing crash is going to happen all over again. And I look at these people and I go, yeah, because you don't read, you don't look at data. Uh, you may read USA Today, but you're not looking at economist information. Facts are facts. The core fundamentals of econ 101, uh, microeconomics, if you, took, if you took econ in college, that was the first class you took. And what the first theory they taught you was supply and demand. And then it went to elasticity and all those th theories we learned. This is supply, guys. Now let's look at demand. So this is two different economists. Uh, every economist is putting this in their presentations. Let me just show you the one on the right. This is from Professor Zandi again uh, from Moody's. This is the distribution of all Americans in the United States from zero to 100 by age. Okay, the ages are written along, excuse me, the horizontal axis. If, if you look at where we are today, you see that circle he put in his chart. Those are the highest peaks of that chart. Now, why is that important? Um, I would look at the chart on the left to tell you why. It's the exact same chart. Uh, this is from census data, uh, two different economists. The economist on the left is the Public Policy Institute in Washington. But if you look at the right side of those yellow bars, it says median age for first-time home buyers is age 34. It's the exact same bars circled by Dr. Zandi on the right. Now, why is this important? Because age 34 is the median age for first-time home buyers. And if you look at that 34 cohort in those yellow bars and look at the age 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, going all the way back to the mid-20s, for the next decade, we have equal to or greater demand of Americans growing into that peak first-time home, first home buyer year. And by the way, it's the biggest bubble that's ever happened in the history of this country. It's only thing close to it was the baby boom generation, which I'm part of. We did our peak buying of our first home in the early 80s. But that generation was smaller than the millennial generation by millions of Americans. Not only that, millennials earn more, inflation adjusted, they make higher incomes. 90% um, of them wanna own a home according to the Fannie Mae Consumer Sentiment uh, Survey. Uh, and you are literally sitting on the front doorsteps of the biggest wave of demand for purchase activity that you will ever have in your career. And no other professional in, in our industry has had this wave. Only you have it right here, right now. And the thing I want to emphasize to you is this. Um, just like baby boomers, if you make a relationship with these guys, these people, these women, these men, uh, Latinos, African Americans, Asians, everybody who's going to want to own homes, you will have them for your life. And that means entry level homes, then a move up home when they have kids. And then when they make more money, they want to live in that neighborhood with that school. Um, then they want the second home. Then they might get relocated. Then there's a change in their lifestyle, marriage, divorce, whatever over time. You will have them for the multitude of homes. I've had 14 homes in my lifetime. I know it's a lot. I relocated a lot in my early career, John, as you well know. Yep. But we all, everybody owns a lot of homes in their life over time. And this is your client base for the future. Guys, supply and demand. Don't think this is like something that you can find out any other time. This is it here now. And it's you. Well, and Dave, think about what you just said too. You bought 14 houses, but you mentioned it earlier your one grown child's buying her second house, right? Like yeah. if you do this right, it's not just about the Dave Stevens that's done 14 homes. How, how farther can you drive down that yeah. inside the family, relatives, all and, that stuff? And John, I'd love to say, that's gonna tell you this quick story. Sarah, my oldest, who's got her master's from the Ford School at University of Michigan. She works in Washington. She did a show with me, an interview on um, Bloomberg television because she said she was never gonna own a home, never. Uh, she just started a professional career. I don't know if you remember it, but it was it got all sorts of laughs inside the Beltway because the head of the MBA's daughter wasn't going right. to buy a home. She then bought her first home, an entry-level home in Arlington, Virginia. Beautiful little box. Um, had a baby. They needed more space. Sold that home. Bought a home in Falls Church, Virginia, a really nice neighborhood. Big, beautiful, brand-new home just built. We were just visiting her last weekend. They're going to sell that home because they want to move out to – 
I, out your way, John, where you live, uh, I can't remember the name of the town, but a new subdivision with sidewalks and swimming pools. That'll be three homes in just a few years for this young couple. That's how you make a living in this business. But you got to adjust. You're not going to have the refi wave of the past. But I assure you, when rates drop a little bit, when the Fed says this is that the Powell says he's done, the psychological impact to the pent up demand of so many Americans who've been sitting waiting for some excuse to go buy a home is going to bust loose. And that's why we're going to have a, a, a better second half than the first half by far. And you saw the forecast for next year and the following year. So <clears throat> rounding this out, guys, and you, John, cut me off. I go too long here. No, you're good. So, man. Keep going. Um, I want to excuse the, uh, I guess my wording didn't the way the slide laid out. But anyway, even with low appreciation, owning a home is far, far better wealth bidder. I just want to walk you through the numbers, guys. You know, we grew up, I keep looking at John, we grew up knowing how to calculate numbers on an HP 12C. And we, we learned how to run numbers for our clients. I just want to run some numbers for you um, as to why owning a home blows away any other investment. People who tell me, you know, I want to put my money in the stock market for a while. Oh, that's really smart. Let, let's talk about that. So the first is if you buy a home today, you get to lever your investment. Average Americans don't get to do this. I sit on the board of directors of a publicly listed New York Stock Exchange real estate investment trust, and I'm on their board. We lever our capital anywhere between six to eight times or so, depending on market conditions. You as a consumer don't get a chance to do that unless you buy a home. If you buy a home, you're buying a $400,000 asset. If you put down, in this case, if you put down 10%, it's 40 grand. And so for your $40,000, you are levering that tenfold to a $400,000 asset. So even modest appreciation, if you just take 2% a year, which would be half of what homes have appreciated in the United States over the last 37 years, if you took 2% a year, that would be eight grand. But that eight grand is a 2% appreciation rate on your asset, but all you put down is 40 grand. That's a 20% return on your investment. It's levered investing, it's other people's money you cannot do that in the stock market. Second, forget appreciation. Mortgage interest deduction. If you itemize, because you have to itemize to get it, on this same deal, I, I took a $360,000 loan. I use 6%, guys, because rates are bumping all over the place. Some of you are doing 10-year arms. Some of you are doing 30 years, whatever it is. I'll just use six for this discussion. Uh, you, can always, you should use the real number for your client. But the P&I is 2158 on the same deal. In the first year, you spend $21,000 in interest. If you're in a 30% tax bracket, which is probably right for most of the country with this uh, size loan, you're going to get a $6,400 tax benefit uh, when you pay your taxes next April. That's $6,400 return on your $40,000 investment per year, just like that $8,000 is per year. That's about an 18% return, guys. So if I take my if I take my 20% return and my 16% return, and someone's going to tell me they're going to be in, do better in the stock market, I really begin to chuckle. And don't forget, guys, not only is this a return, it's a tax shelter. You don't get a tax shelter with your stock investment. You don't get a tax shelter with any other investment in your life. No other uh, modernized uh, nation on this globe has mortgage interest deduction, just the United States. It's an amazing investment return opportunity. Third, capital gains. If you invest in the stock market, you're going to pay capital gains on everything you earn. If you buy a home, it's like an IRA, a 401k. It's a retirement plan because you get to shelter if you're single, $250,000 of that gain or $500,000 if you're married when you sell that home down the road. It's an annuity that becomes an inheritable asset for your children over time. And then finally, just amortization, get a mortgage pay on it. And this loan, you pay down 25 grand over five years. Now, I, I, I know this is math and it gets people rolling their eyes, but it's real. I mean, not only are we have rates at literally near historic lows if you take out quantitative easing, and we have a, a forecast of nothing but increases in purchase demand over the next few years, in a nation where home values never go down, where we have a, the, the most incredible shortage of supply that we haven't seen since the 1970s, 
and we have the biggest wave of demand coming our way that's never been before seen in American history. The math alone says go buy a home. Buy it now. Buy it as soon as you can if you can afford it and if you can find a home for sale that you can bargain on and get. Last couple of slides, John. Yeah, go. So, so this is from the Federal Reserve. They have a site called the Survey of Consumer Finances. I encourage you all to go pull it up. I, this is my screenshot. I did it myself. I went to the Survey of Consumer Finances. I hit the drop-down screen on the left, and I hit net worth for a household financial component. I looked at median net worth. You see I highlighted in that little blue button there under units. I uh, looked at median net worth for all Americans distribute by housing status. The green line, flat line on the bottom is the median net worth of all Americans going back to 1989 to 2019. Um, so that's two decades. Uh, and that's the median net worth for renters, that little flat green line at the bottom. The turquoise line, or whatever color that is, that's the median net worth for all Americans if they own a home anywhere during that period of time. Taking into account all those recessions, including the Great Recession, and even with the Great Recession, Americans, on average, had more net worth uh, than any renter in this country. Now, did some people get hurt in the Great Recession? Absolutely. Um, you know, it destroyed places like Detroit, Michigan, and we all have stories of people who got harmed. But in a general terms, even with the worst recession in American history, you're far better off owning a home. I throw this slide in because this is from Harvard University. Um, this is from the Joint Center for Housing Studies, which is like the um, master's in po po political science at Harvard. It's in the Kennedy School at Harvard, um, which is their public policy school. So uh, every summer in June, they put out the State of the Nation's Housing Report. This comes directly from the uh, Kennedy School at Harvard. You see it listed on the bottom, the State of the Nation's Housing 2022 came out last year. They took the same data from that previous slide. But they, they're making a social comment that says, even if they own homes, Black and Hispanic households have significantly less wealth than white homeowners, which is true. But nevertheless, I don't care if you're African American, Latino, Asian, or white non-Hispanic, the yellow bars are your median net worth if you own a home. The blue bars aren't renters. The little red slivers along the bottom are renters. The blue is the average for that ethnicity in this country. And all it says is, if you can get people, more people into homes, particularly African-Americans and Hispanics, you're going to be building better long-term wealth opportunities for America. Why do you think um, uh, Sandra Thompson forced the GSEs to come out with that LLPA grid you just got that juices all of those high LTV, low FICO buckets and cross uh, collateralize them with, fight, with buckets of increase in, in LLPAs for better credit quality borrowers, cash out refis, two to fours, high bail and all that other stuff. Now, I don't agree with the policy, but nevertheless, why did she do it? Because she knows that it, the GSEs, if they can get more African-Americans as first time home buyers and Hispanics into home ownership in this country, they will begin to build greater long lasting inheritable wealth, which is good for the country. So if that argument sits with public policymakers, why, why the heck should we ever second guess it ourselves? Not that all public policymakers are right, but this is a really simple academic exercise. Okay, last bit. This is it. Final round. I know a lot of people say, well, I read, I read a story in the press. I saw Diana Olick. She says uh, you shouldn't buy a home. And I, many of you have seen the Diana Olick slides, so I didn't show them of all the time she's been wrong on her um, on, on her forecasts and her prognostications. By the way, Diana is the business, the housing editor on CNBC on Squawk Box. I've been on her show a million times and she, I, I like her a lot, but she's not an economist. She doesn't even have a master's in finance. She graduated with a journalism degree. But these are four articles I highlight from financial press, okay? The bottom left from Wharton, you know, the business school at the University of Pennsylvania, why the housing market is not in recession. And literally all it does is talk about shortages in supply and demographics coming our way. The bottom right is The Economist, a, a publication so nerdy, most of you probably don't read it. No, I'm not insulting you. It is a nerdy publication. And look at their headline. Millennial demand helps stoke the housing boom. Barron's, another financial publication. Millennials will drive home prices up for years to come. 
And then the top left is John Reed. He writes for Time and others, but he has a master's in finance, and I always read his stuff. But anyway, waiting on the housing market to crash, don't experts say, here's how today's housing market is different from the Great Recession and housing bubble. And what did all these guys write about in their stories? Everything I just told you. I, they write about the demographics, which I showed you. They write about the shortage of housing supply, which I showed you. Um, it's too easy to look ahead and say, it, it, it's, it's just natural logic. Okay, last slide, and then I'm going to go to the closed. Um, the close, as it were. Forget the left. You saw that. I showed you two demographic slides before. This is from the MBA. Now, they didn't do those other two demographic slides. But look on the right. This is why that age 34 is so profound. That gray line along the bottom, that's the home ownership rate for Americans under the age of 35 going back to 2002 from 2022. So two decades, the average home ownership rate for people under the age of 35 is very low. But what happens when you get just one step over age 30, in the, over age 35, actually age 35 to 44? That's the yellow line directly above it. The home ownership rate doesn't just incrementally increase. It leaps. It's dramatic. And yes, it's a decade period of time, 35 to 44. But that's why economists and analysts can say with absolute certainty, gang, buckle in. You're on the front doorsteps of the biggest wave of home buying demand that has never before existed in the United States of America. And the only thing holding everybody back is psychology. It's fear of what might happen to home prices. Well, the slide on the right is from uh, Moody's Analytics. They're predicting virtually flat home price appreciation and then slow, steady home price appreciation going forward. And the slide on the left is also from that same, econ same economist predicting home sales increasing. Uh, he calls them weak in early 20 in 23, but he says rebound in the second half of 2023 and home sales start increasing. I, I do all of this to show you the consistency. Even the quote on the right, which is from Odetta Kushi, who's a great economist at First American, once mortgage rates have peaked, the housing market will likely stabilize. Once adjusted for the new normal for our higher rates, the housing market will benefit from continued strong demographic demand relative to an overall long run shortage of supply. So based on current dynamics, it appears the market may be poised to stabilize this year. Okay, so I'm going to end with these thoughts. Gang, this is all about you. You're the difference in your community. You're the difference to how your realtors think about the market, your home builders, whoever your referral partners are, you are the difference. And make no mistake about it, it requires selling skills. Because in the end of the day, you've got to be able to take these slides and say, this is data. I'm not, I'm not making up a story here. I didn't make up the story I showed you today. I just look at the data and come up with the same conclusions that those economists who said rates are going to go to X and this is my forecast for purchases uh, over the next few years. I just agree with them. But you're the difference. You're the only one who's going to make this happen. And you can become an asset to your real estate agent partner in a way that makes you a value necessity when they go talk to their client. And that's exactly where you want to be. Yes, the market's going to slow, but we're going to remain above the previous decade, actually two decades, as I showed you. This year will be the third best year in the last 22 years or 21 years, and the next two years will be even better, uh, moving into second and thir third place for the best years over the last two and a half decades. America needs more new homes. We have a shortage of supply. And you saw the home builder sentiment survey that just came out yes yesterday or this morning, Best home builder sentiment we've seen in decades, uh, since 2009. Um, third, rates, and I put probably, rates probable to drop next year, but they're going to drop. I'm just putting in here for my own uh, protection if you use my slide. <laughs> demographics, the core fundamentals of demographics and supply, supply and demand, microeconomics 101, that has not changed. And that's what leads me to the final three points. This winter is going to be what I believe the final time of opportunity for uh, potentially buying a home in a bit of a buyer's market. It's not a buyer's market everywhere, uh, but there are pockets of it all over the place. And sellers who are a little worried because they're buying into the emotion might pay for the 
2-1 buy down or the 1-0 buy down or might pay some closing costs or negotiate a little bit on price. Um, all of that's possible and that will be done. By the time we get to the end of the year and we're back in the seller's market, it's over. And so this is a unique opportunity this winter. It just takes someone to nudge them off the, the edge. The last point, I'm going to say risks always exist. We know that. The last point is this. You know, we're in a business where we have to practice optimism. It's real easy to get down. It's real easy this winter to get down. I'm talking to loan officers all day long who are my clients' loan officers who are, who are struggling, even old timers who are struggling because they have to sort of start over. But if you can figure out an, a, an approach, if you can figure out, oh, I'm going to take this and go run with it and make 100 broker, you know, calls on real estate agents because I want to show them a unique idea that they can use to present – to the potential home buyers to motivate them to take advantage of this, what's going to be an amazing market, then I, then I have something to do uh, in my life. And I think that's, that's where this stuff comes. Use data and be the leader. And I want to end, John, and I'll shut up, <laughs> is, look, I'm talking like a loan rep kind of as, uh, because I started in that field. And John remembers how I used to run sales meetings back decades ago. I ended up being the advisor to the president of the United States. I sat in the Oval Office with President Obama at least every three weeks, and help design housing policy for this nation. You know, we all evolve in our own careers, but I never forget the core fundamentals of where I started, and n neither do any of you. But I would end with this last thought. I used to sell office equipment before I got into selling mortgages back in 1980. Um, and, uh, and office equipment was different because I had to create the need in the seller's, in the buyer's mind that they needed my product. It was a different kind of sell. I had to actually convince them they were missing a product that they needed. A potential home buyer wants a home. Every American, actually, over 90% of them want a home. So you have, the, you have the need, the want created in their mind. What's holding them back? Emotion, lack of facts, lack of perspective, someone who's not there helping them. And it won't take much of a nudge for them to say, wow, that makes sense to me. So I'm hoping you take some of that and run with it. Yeah. Hey, look, guys, uh, I, I think you see in the beginning why I said I'm always excited when Dave's uh, willing to do something like this, because as we try to bring value to you as our business partner, somebody like Dave and his experience, I mean, the whole time I'm listening to him, I'm thinking of like him as what he would be doing at the end. Like if he were sitting in front of his referral partners, his real estate agents or his financial planners, or you started asserting who his business partners are. And there's so much value in this session, right? And look, there's a bunch of questions. You've answered most of them along the way. And there's more comments about, Hey, this is your best flex ever, right? As far as the content, the timing of this. And look, this is what I love about working with Dave and knowing Dave is, it's just all data and it's analytics driven, right? The numbers don't lie. And when you look at some of his charts that he puts out there with the eight recessions and the 10 recessions and see, depending on what the topic is that he's talking about, right? Whether it be appreciation, home value, what happens to interest rates, those aren't anomalies. That's historical trends, right? And the value that this brings is tremendous. That's what I love about it because he takes the emotion out of it, right? It's like, you're a, you're a professional. How do you add value to what you do? Here's what you should be looking at. So, Dave, I, I can't thank you enough. Anything, just trying to look real quick, you, you hit that. Somebody asked about, like, borrowers that are approved but priced out right now. What would your advice be? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I get that usually at the end of every one of these that I do. I do a lot of these. Um, that's that's going to be the problem in our market. We don't have inventory, and we don't have affordable inventory. That's not going to go away, guys. Um, I will tell you that, you know, as I said earlier, and I can show the, the data on it, but millennials are better qualified to buy homes. Their incomes, inflation adjusted, are higher than either Generation X or the baby boom generation, inflation adjusted, which is really important. But also we've seen home prices skyrocket out of control. So um, it means that, you know, they're not all going to necessarily have an available home to buy, depending where they live. And that's just going to be the reality of, what happens going forward, but it still doesn't mean that the demand isn't going to be extraordinary. Um, we have far too many home buyers that are going to be chasing far too many homes. And that's why home price appreciation is a certainty, not the 18 to 20% we saw in 2021, uh, which was crazy, 
out of control of uh, inflation, but we have, we'll see solid, steady home price appreciation over the many years to come going forward here. Yeah. Look, gang, I, I've seen Dave do this presentation in person at events in some form or fashion. And when he always talks about the demographic of baby boomers, Gen X millennials, I've probably seen that 10 times from him and it's just eye opening every time I see it, right? Like what is coming our way and the opportunity that we have. It's well, you know, and the hard part is uh, John, which everybody here knows everybody's watching this. You're living in the here and now and the here and now is not good. Uh, I get it. Um, some of you are having better years, years perhaps than others. That's for certain. But I know across the board, it's, it's a real, it's a struggle right now. This, this uh, we're in the heart of winter Purchases are cyclical uh, business, not like refis. When rates are two and a quarter, you can refi a loan in the middle of winter in Minnesota in January, you know. Uh, but people don't buy homes uh, under that uh, context. They buy homes typically in the spring market, which starts late February, uh, runs March, April, May, early June. Sometimes see a lull for the summer. Then we have a, another fall market pickup. And that's sort of how the housing purchase market works. So you just don't feel it, right? And um, And so... You know, I, that's why my last comment on my last slide is you got to practice optimism. You got to wake up every morning if you're going to stay in the business because you have no choice. You're going to wake up every morning and say, I'm going to be optimistic today. I'm going to go charge. I'm going to go get rejected by 10 realtors uh, trying to get appointments with them to show them my deck that I put together out of this presentation, whatever else you add to it. Uh, there's so much good information out there. Yeah, but it's hard like not to start nodding. It's hard to start not start nodding your head when the data starts singing to you and saying, whoa, that's really good, you know? Well, again, that was one of the things I was gonna tell everybody, that question came up a couple of times. We obviously have this presentation that Dave did for us. So our AEs, our salespeople will have that, highly encourage you, you know, to work with our salespeople on putting some value from some of the slides into content that you can share with your people. Um, hey, Dave, I can't thank you enough, brother. I always appreciate when you do this. And I know you referenced a couple of times, I tell people all the time, I go back, I'm in like the Andy Reid coaching tree. I'm in that, I, I'm lucky enough to count myself in that Dave Stevens coaching tree uh, for a little, even if it was a little speck on the radar screen. And Dave knows well, this, we well, share this with him. And when I see him next time for a drink, he's, he owes me a story back. But, you know, Dave's somebody that changed the trajectory of my career. Um, and he never, didn't, he didn't realize he did it. Um, and I've shared that with him and I won't bore all you guys with it, but just a valuable resource to us in the industry, uh, you know, always fighting for us, always advocating on, on behalf of mortgage professionals. And I always, when he gives us time like this, I always appreciate it. Hey, can you pump the link at the bottom? Yeah. I wanted you to talk about that. So near and dear to Dave's heart, uh, obviously a lot of you guys probably know the story, Stephen strong, but then here's a link. So Dave, I'll let you go into it. Yeah. So guys, I have uh, stage four cancer and, um, uh, you know, for when you have stage four prostate cancer, the average lifespan for men, 80% die within five years. I'm on year seven. Um, and I'm barely detectable because I was taken under the wing of the head of research at Johns Hopkins, you know, the well-known hospital and university in Baltimore, Maryland, Ken Pienta, who's the head of research for all of Johns Hopkins. And they've made some incredible breakthroughs that I'm confident are gonna actually find the cure for this cancer. And by the way, this cancer, if they find the cure for this cancer, it'll, be, it'll apply to breast cancer as well and many other cancers. We run a, a drive every year called Stephen Strong. It's available through this link. Um, I would love it if any of you have a family member who's fighting cancer, if you've been fighting cancer, doesn't have to be prostate cancer. If you could just consider making a donation, tax deductible, it's in this link. Um, and uh, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Any amount, you know, is great. I've had CEOs of mortgage companies have given me $100,000 this year, 125000 and more. And lots of other loan officers across the country have given me hundreds of dollars or whatever. It's whatever you could possibly do would be really helpful because every dollar goes to research. And that's so critical for research hospitals. So thanks. Yeah, and Dave, I know this drive you've raised a lot of money that's doing a lot of good. And as he mentioned, it's not a particular cancer. I think in talking to Dave and doing some research, when I've done some donations, you figure out a couple of things, like he mentioned, right? There's a, there's a link to breast cancer that it could you know, impact as well. So 
Guys, every dollar matters. If you have it within your heart um, to do that, please take a look. Use this link below uh, and, and would certainly appreciate anybody donate, donating as well. Um, Dave, anything in closing? Are you good? Great to be with you. Great to be with all of you. We're going to see you, but I'll be keynoting the uh, the MBA in Atlantic City, the infamous conference that they do out there every year, uh, the Northeast MBA. So if anybody's up there, look forward to seeing you there. But in the meantime, uh, take care. Yeah, good deal, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, gang. Hey, look, there's a ton of value in there. We will get you the presentation. And I think, you know, before I kind of tell you what our next flex series is going to be like, I would tell you, if you listen to that, right, it's about perspective. It's about understanding the facts and the data. It's about not buying into the national media spin and understanding your market, where your community is and where your buyers and your customers are looking to transact, right? And a lot of what Dave talked about and showed, you can find those same things and break them down into your local community. But I would tell you one thing, and, and if there's people on Flagstar in my organization here in this, they're going to cringe because I say it to them every time. I really do believe when he talks about optimism, you have a choice every day, right? And, and, and God, I'm going to say this. To me, there's two things, attitude and effort, right? At the end of the day, no matter how bad it is, and it's, you know, look, we're definitely, like Dave mentioned, times are tough right now. But if you've been in this for longer than a cup of coffee, you've been through cycles before where you've had really good years followed by challenging years. But the attitude and effort, two things nobody can influence, two things nobody can take away from you is when you wake up every day, what attitude and what effort are you bring into what you do? Because I guarantee you it's contagious and I guarantee you you'll lift somebody up. Um, Dave joked around about going out and talking to real estate agents when we worked it together, went way, way back. We used to do like phone blitzes every Monday to set appointments. And rather than recognizing the yeses, meaning I booked five appointments, we would recognize the people who had the most no's. And we made a game out of it, right? We tried to have fun with it. So attitude and effort, two things nobody can take away from you. Um, and with that being said, hey, thank you. We appreciate the time. Next month, uh, the I think we're bringing this up now, hopefully. Next month, the um, Flex Series is going to be uh, the second Thursday in March, uh, again, at 2 o'clock. And it's going to be uh, Joe Wilson from Social Coach. And he's going to talk to us a lot, kind of tagging off what we did with Josh Pitts, but going in a little bit different direction uh, and, and driving a little bit more into some things that maybe you haven't thought about from a social perspective before. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty eye opening and how you can reach out to some of those millennials that Dave talked about and get in touch with them. So really looking forward to Joe. Again, guys, appreciate it. And if you have any questions, make sure you're reaching out to your AE, but we'll certainly work with you on Dave's presentation. And as always, hey, thanks for your time. Thanks for your partnership. We know you have choices. We love the fact that you partner with Flagstar and we can't thank you enough for that partnership. Have a great day.